I want to welcome you to a third, the third of our, my fourth town hall on the proposed 2020 budget. Uh, before we get to the discussion period of this uh, town hall, I want to uh, first talk about some of the realities and some of the, uh, the notion behind uh, this proposed budget. It is a bold budget. We recognize that. There are some reasons why I proposed the budget that I did. First, I set some ground rules. My grandmother taught me one rule that sticks with me today. That is the golden rule. That is treat others the way you want to be treated. So everything tonight will be centered around the word respect. We will, thank you, thank you. That's not something that should be, you know, that should just be a given in our politics today, but everything tonight will be centered around the word respect because at the end of the day, we all want the city to go in the same direction. We may disagree on how to get it there, but we all want the city to go in the same direction. All right, so when I first began this job in 2017, I told the public that I would do a few things before ever looking at it. Number one, I said I would perform a, I would conduct a performance review of every single department in my first 100 days. We did that. I said that we would commit to collecting more of the taxes that we've been owed. We've made some serious steps towards that. I said that I would go across the street and beg and lobby the Commonwealth of Virginia for more dollars. And in December and January, we teamed up as a community, and we did that. I also said that we have to use every tool in our toolbox when it comes to expanding the tax base in the city. That means economic development, particularly downtown redevelopment. We've proposed it. And with all that we have done, we still were looking at a budget that essentially was the status quo. And we also know some of the harsh realities that we'll talk about in a minute that this city still faces. Now I had a choice to make. Do I sit on my hands and continue with the status quo of the city? Or do we continue the work of trying to fix it? Not just Richmond Public Schools, but also the roads that also hinder us from progress. And that's why I proposed this budget. Now I recognize those who've lived in the city for a very long time have experienced some mismanagement of Richmond government, a lack of transparency in Richmond government. But that is why I'm here tonight to have this discussion. Because this is about the future of our city. And we have a choice to make. We'll talk about it a little further. Either we can continue to be a top 10 place for people who want to just visit and spend money in our bars, in our breweries, in our restaurants, or we can be a top 10 place where people can live. This budget is about the latter. So the harsh reality is this. No politician has told you this, but I will today. And I said it on March 6th when I proposed this budget. We have been building budgets for roughly a decade or more now, on deferred maintenance, on disinvestment, and on dishonesty. And on dishonesty. And let me tell you why. We have told you that we can still provide a high quality service as a city with less staff, with less money. And you have not gotten that. This isn't anything new. You have not gotten that. I think it's time we fix that with this budget. Here are a couple visuals. This is a group of children sitting around a heater with coats on in the wintertime, not in Alabama, not in Mississippi, but here in Richmond. 
is every day for the 24,000 kids who attend Richmond Public Schools who don't have a high quality facility. Number two, this is a bathroom not in Mississippi, not in Alabama, in the city of Richmond. This bathroom is fixed, but these sort of conditions continue to play many of our kids who walk through our doors. In addition to that, you've all seen this. You've seen that. You've seen these potholes. You've traversed our streets. Bobby Vince is going to step up here in a few and talk to you about our deficient road network in the city. 65% of the roads in this city are either very poor or fair. And they're mostly on the very poor side because we've not had a sustainable paving program in years. And in this district right here, in the first ward, you have the fourth worst roads in all the city. Now some real competition now in the East End. So here's the reality on public schools. Let's first start with this. 73 of 100 babies born in the city of Richmond are enrolled in Richmond Public Schools. 73 of 100. 27 of 100 white babies born in this city are enrolled in Richmond Public Schools. So the question is, Mr. Mayor, where are they enrolled? They're not enrolled in Richmond. They're enrolled in Henrico, in Chesterfield, in Hanover, and all the private schools we have to offer here in the region not enrolled in Richmond Public Schools. 74% of Latino kids in this city drop out. We have the lowest graduation rate in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Half of our schools are unaccredited. And 75% of RPS students live near or below the poverty line. As you all know, 40% of our children live below the poverty line in the city. Let's talk about our streets. As I said earlier, 65% of our streets are very poor, very, uh, fair to very poor. But we did a survey last year, 73% of the respondents or residents in our survey said that the number one issue, uh, that 73% that, that said that the, the, the roads, that they were dissatisfied with street conditions. That's pretty bad. And Bobby Vince will talk, will it cost us $100 million in street repair. Now, this is despite the work of the Department of Public Works already. We filled 50,000 potholes in the city over two years. 2,900 alleys have been fixed in two years. 3,200 sidewalks have been fixed in two years. 175 miles, lay miles of road have been repaired. But we are still in this deficit today. I talk to other mayors from around the country and I tell them that, because I'm very proud of my numbers. And I told them I actually repaired 50,000 potholes. They look at me like I got three heads. Because why are you fixing 50,000 potholes in one year and in two years when you should be paving? So, what does my budget consist of? What's it? First, a collective of $37 million devoted to Richmond Public Schools. This is the largest contribution to Richmond Public Schools in a generation, 25 years. Thank you. So to fund the Dream for RPS strategic plan that focuses on the classroom, six million of that 17.8 million up there will be for teacher raises. Also, 19 million dedicated to fix one of those bathrooms and the roofs and the HVAC bins that still hinder the progress of our schools. The school board, with Ms. Doors right here, has been asking for that sort of funding for maintenance for, for a very, very long time, before her time on the school board. Also, we've quadrupled the number of dollars we've dedicated to paving in the city. $16.2 million will be dedicated to paving and sidewalk repairs. In 2019, we budgeted 3.5 million roughly. In 2018, we budgeted 2.89 million. 
That is why we have to fill 50,000 potholes in two years. We're putting band-aids on problems that really just need to be fixed. I put also extra million dollars in the budget, roughly, to, for transportation for the communities that need it the most so they get from their job to the, to, the, to the job, to home, home to the job. Another key component of the budget, roughly a half a million dollars towards eviction diversion. You all read about it in the New York Times. <laughs> Richmond will have the second highest rate of evictions in the United States of America. And we were on the front page for that. And guess what? When you overlay were the highest eviction rates in this city on top of where our schools are underperforming, it matches up perfectly. Because guess what? If you don't know where you're going to sleep at night, it makes it very difficult to wake up the next day and do mathematics, and to read, and to perform well in the classroom. And we have to fix that. So our goal is working with our partner system to mitigate 500 of those evictions each and every year, starting this summer. And also, we put $2.9 million in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund because guess what? 27,000 people now call Richmond home. Many are young people and empty nesters. And we are creating a squeeze in many of our neighborhoods. We can only look, this, this tonight's about looking forward, but just one thing to look backward real quick. We all know that this is all by design while we're in this situation today. You look at our neighborhoods that are suffering the most, and you look at them 40 or 50 years from now. This was put by design by some of our predecessors. I'm the one in this room. We have to fix these issues if we want to continue to be an inclusive and competitive city. Let's talk about the efficiencies we brought into city government. Before I was mayor, our city could not even submit its CAFR, its comprehensive audit and finance report on time. This is essentially the receipts for what you did in one year, what you bought, what you spent your money on. We couldn't do that. Since I've been mayor, we not only submitted it on time, we've submitted it early, saving the city millions of dollars. We are a double A plus city, one step below a triple A. So when I hear people say, about how Richmond is wasting money or how Richmond is spending its money. Well, the credit rating agencies in Wall Street don't think that. You ask Moody's, S&P, and Fitch. They put us one step below AAA. We've increased our tax collection rate. More of our taxes are being collected in the city than they were before I took office. And this budget features that, about 97%. Correct, Mr. Green? Delinquent taxes have been collected. We had a tax amnesty program our first year. Telling folks, hey, yo, taxes, no penalty, come pay them. And we're selling more of those abandoned and delinquent properties as well than we ever had before. We've moved such operations like snow plowing inside government. Why? Because we had contracts on the books that we were paying folks $500 an hour to plow the snow. Your taxpayer dollars. And they came back to us in the court of the next year and said, we're going to up that to $800 an hour to pay this now. Now, I would recommend to you all, you all might want to go get a truck <laughs> and get your own plowing company to get $800. But we said no. We brought that inside city government. We're taking over the operation of the 17th Street Market and the Main Street Station as well. No longer contracting that out externally bringing those operations inside, saving the taxpayers some dollars. But guess what? We cannot cut our way to the top. If we're going to be a competitive city when it comes to education, and our roads are going to actually be a place where folks can actually do commerce in the city, you're not going to find those in cuts in City Hall. Many, many years ago, over the last decade, we have cut this city to the bone. 3,800 or 4,200 positions in this city our field currently. So we're doing a lot with less. And you have the lowest paid government workforce in the region. In the region. The folks that Bobby depends on, the Department of Public Works, the plow the snow, the pick up the trash, 
to fill the potholes, they have not received a pay raise in 15 years. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I can't sleep at night knowing that the people who pick up our trash are, getting, are not getting what they're, they're owed for doing a good job. So folks always want to compare us to the counties. That is the number one go-to. Let me talk about it real quick. We are not Henrico County. We are not Chesterfield County. And we surely are not Hanover. Let me tell you why. We were the capital, the Commonwealth of Virginia. We were the headquarters of state government. 30% of our land is occupied by state government. Or a non, or 30% of our land is tax exempt. A vast majority of it is VCU or other colleges and the Commonwealth of Virginia. But guess what? With that great title being a state capital, what, what do you get for that? We miss out on $50 million in tax dollars every year. Can you imagine what we could do with $50 million? I know I do. And outside of that, we are the urban core of the Richmond region. And 25% of our citizenry is, lives under the poverty line, which means we have a special burden that our friends in Henrico and Chesterfield and Hanover do not carry. Non-taxable land and a high rate of poverty. So, you would think that the Commonwealth would understand our plight. But they don't. Because the way they fund education doesn't take into consideration, number one, poverty. And they believe, through their funding formula, that the kids who live in Chesterfield and Henrico are needier. Why? Because their formula evaluates land value. And guess what? We have more valuable land in Henrico, Henrico and Chesterfield. Because You've been downtown and see those tall buildings? Ever seen the state capitol? It's valuable property down there in downtown. And a river runs through it. However, we don't receive tax dollars on those properties. So it changes the ability to pay. What does it say right here? 2.5 times, we have 2.5 times the poverty than Henrico. We have 3.5 times the poverty than Chesterfield. Yet they receive more dollars for their schools than we do. Also, I hear about how we go about, what do we, how do we spend our money? So folks want to compare us to the Loudons and the Arlingtons and the Fairfax and the Newport Newses and the Norfolks and the Hamptons. Let me tell you how we spend our money. We may categorize our money differently. We do that. But we are not off from where our peers spend their money. Of the $91 million spent on general administration of government, the operations of City Hall, was it 49? $48 million of that 91 is spent on GRTC, that's our transit authority here in the city, or in the region. Other government agencies like Richard Behavioral Health Authority, Richard Ambulance Authority, some of these other localities that we are compared to, the Virginia Beaches, and the Norfolks and the Hamptons, down in Hampton Roads, they don't spend their monies on authorities like we do. We do it more in a collective way with the region. And so this inflates the number when it comes to general administration. So our spending on general administration is not out of whack with the Newport News and the Hamptons. Those are just the facts. Let's take a talk a little about the history of the real estate tax rate in the city of Richmond. In 1988, when I was seven years old, the tax rate in the city of Richmond for real estate was $1.53 per 100. But that was just a thought in 1980. It was $2.12. Now, you can easily track the disinvestment and the deferred maintenance in city government with this graph. When we went down to the lowest tax rate in the city's history, 
Let me repeat that. The lowest tax rate in the city's history. That's when people started to see, wow, they're not paving my road like they used to pay. Wow, we're not contributing to schools like we used to. And with that, as you all know, the cost of doing business has changed over the last 10, 11 years. It costs more to go to movies today than it did 10 years ago, correct? It costs more for a Big Mac than it did today than it did 10 years ago. And the materials and the supplies and health care and the contracts cost more today than they did 10 years ago. The cost of government also has gone up. And I will add, you look at, compared to the taxes we've collected, compared to inflation, there is a $20.35 million gap. Now, add that $20.35 million gap to the $50 million I told you that we're not collecting because of non-taxable land. That's $70 million the city of Richmond doesn't receive. So, the fix. What I propose in my bold budget is to roll the recession tax rates, recessionary tax rate back to $1.29, what it was before the recession which will create $21.1 million. And then to add a 50 cent tax to all cigarettes sold in the city of Richmond, 50 cents per pack, the first of its kind ever in the city's history, creating about roughly $24 million that will be dedicated to schools and fixing streets. That is the gist of my plan. Also, I'll add this, the Alexandrians, the, the Hamptons and the Newport News, and even yesterday, Virginia Beach proposed a tax increase on real estate. All match, all are rolling back to recession era rates. Richmond is the last to do so. Let's look at who pays the real estate tax in the city of Richmond. Let's look at that bucket. All right? I'm going to read it because I know it's a little small for some of those folks who are challenged with their site. If you own a property up to $100,000, uh, that is valued at $100,000, you make up 4% of the tax collection pie, the real estate tax pie. If you own a property between $100,000 and $200,000 of value, you make up 10.5% of the real estate tax pie. If you own a property between $200,000 and $300,000, you pay 10.8% of the real estate tax pie. If you own a property that is valued at $300,000 or more, you make up roughly 30% of the tax collection pie. If you are a renter on a condo, 18.2%. And if you are a part of a corporate, you are a corporation, commercial, or industrial owner of business, you make up 26.3% of the tax collection pie. So roughly 60% of the real estate taxes in the city are paid for by those individuals and families that own properties above $300,000 and above, and those businesses and corporations in the city. But this is a compassionate city. We focus on that every single day. So if you are elderly, you are disabled, we also provide tax relief. And I thank the city council for upping the number, upping the, uh, the uh, amount of income that you can have before we provide that tax relief. So if you make up to $60,000, you might, and are 65 years or older, or disabled, and are living on a fixed income, you qualify for tax relief from the city. So if you make between zero and $30,000, we will relieve all of your taxes in this city, if you're elderly and you're dis disabled. Last year, we came to the public and asked for a little increase on the mills tax, because we saw conditions, like you saw earlier, in some critical places around our city, particularly George Mason Elementary School. And Doug Wilder and Henry Marsh grabbed me and both say to me that that place was in critical shape when they went to school there. That's when you know we got a problem. 
So, that, those dollars from last year are now working to build three new schools in this city. <laughs> Georgia Mason Elementary School, Green Elementary School on the south side, and a new middle school on the south side as well. Three new schools coming our way. So the, the question we have to ask ourselves is what kind of city do we want to be? As I started this with, do we want a city that where it's just a top tip place for people to visit or a top tip place for people to live? At the end of the day, you ask any of your friends in Henrico, in Chesterfield, in Hanover, why they don't no longer, why they no longer live in a city, and they'll give you one answer. It's the schools. It's the schools. When I'm out down, when I'm downtown dining during lunchtime, folks come up to me and say, hey, keep up what you're doing. And I say, oh, where do you live? What do they tell me? Oh, sir, I live in Rico. Oh, why do you live in Rico? Well, man, I got kids. When my barber, who grew up in this city, and went to George with, played basketball on the basketball team, is a merchant here in town, and he said his father was willing to give his house that was paid off free to him and his family. You know what he told his dad? No, thank you, dad. I'll pay my mortgage in Henrico because I, I got kids. Our community will be judged on the value of education we are able to deliver. And thus far, we have not been doing a very good job. That's just the honest truth. So we're going to create a community where people are surviving, or we're going to create a community where people are thriving. I choose the latter. We're going to have Bobby Vincent come up real quick to talk about the deficiencies in our road network. Bobby? Um, good evening, everyone. It's good to see so many smiling faces out there this afternoon. Um, I've been up there speaking before you all for quite some time. I've uh, been with the city of Richmond for 26 years, seen a lot of public utilities, seen a lot of public works. Been on probably just about every street within the city of Richmond. Been responsible for a great deal of work that has taken place, as well as a great deal of work that needs to take place in the front of your home and as well as behind your homes, as well as those major thoroughfares on your way to work, on your way home, on your way to entertainment places, schools, etc. I'm native Richmond, born in Richmond Memorial Hospital. I drive on the same streets you drive on. My baby boy goes to Richmond Public Schools. In other words, you're looking at a man that's vested, my best in Richmond. I want to see the exact same things that you all want to see. And in the worst case scenario, if I'm not hearing it from you all, I'm hearing it from my wife. <laughs> so you can assure that when I hit a pothole, or when she hits a pothole, or when my middle son hits a pothole, that money comes out of my pocket as well. And it has. The $16.2 million that the mayor is proposing is not money that needs to be a choice. Here in Richmond right now, with regards to the condition of our roads, we are all thirsty. Only thing that this budget is doing is offering you water. Who wouldn't want to offer water to somebody that's thirsty? Who wouldn't want to offer food to somebody that's hungry? Our roads right now, they're dry. That's why the potholes aren't last, I mean the filling of the potholes aren't last. It takes oil in the street in order for the oil, for the material that's filling the potholes to bond to it. If not, it's like putting asphalt in the sand. So yes, we do have to go back and repair potholes over and over and over again. And no, it's not fair to have us compared to uh, the counties, because in the city of Richmond, many of our roadways are over 100 years old. I don't know how old Short Pump is, but it's not 100 years old. <laughs> In addition to that, we have utilities underneath our streets. 
In the cabins, they have utilities in people's front yards. So every time that something goes wrong or a new development takes place, our streets have to be dug up. We have to dig down 3 to 15 feet within our roadways. That causes problems. We're working with the Department of Public Utilities as well as Economic Development to make sure that we get the biggest bang for our buck. But $3 million a year, $2 million a year, it's never going to cut it with regards to the needs that we have. This will be the first time in my profession that I'll be able to pay over 200 lane hours. And what is that going to do for us? That means multiple neighborhoods and multiple major arterials within every council district, which when many of us are driving in the street, we'll be honest, I care less about your council district. When I'm driving in the street, nothing dings in my car letting me know that I just crossed into another council district. I'm driving in the street listening to whatever I'm listening to. And so are you. It's all about Richmond. And when you look at the maps of the city of Richmond, the 50,000 potholes that the mayor referred to are in every single last council district. But you want to know where they are not as prevalent? In those neighborhoods that we paid over the last five years. There's still some there, but they're not as prevalent. So in those streets that we haven't paid in the last 10 to 15 years, the streets are going to be riddled with problems. And I'm tired of practicing. I practice as much as I can practice. I'm ready, I'm ready for game day. <laughs> We've looked at the data. We know what the conditions are on every single road in the city of Richmond. Please look at joining the mayor and getting this budget approved so that we can play the game of repairing our streets. Thank you. Tonight we have with us also the superintendent of public schools for now, a year into his job, uh, my good friend, Jason Campbell. Thank you, good evening. Let me just start by recognizing we have the chair of the Richmond City School Board, Don Page, here this evening, as well as your representative, Liz Dorr. Uh, I just want to begin by, by saying thank you to the mayor for putting forth this incredibly courageous budget that fully funds the request that Richmond Public Schools put to the mayor. Yeah, that's where we are. That's where we are. And you know, I, I joke with him, this wasn't the uh, easy political thing to do, but it was the right thing to do. The right thing to do for the children and families of Richmond. The first question I get asked about this budget is, why do you need more money? Well, it's pretty simple. Richmond Public Schools has the honor of serving 24,000 kids. A large majority of those young people are living in poverty every day. And it is expensive to meet the needs of children growing up in poverty. I know you can't all read this, but a study was just released by Rutgers University and a nonprofit called the Education Law Center. They looked at a data set of school funding all across the country. It's a groundbreaking study. And here's what they found. If your school division has 40% or more kids living in poverty, in RPS, we're at about 70%. You need twenty to $30,000 per child to achieve average test scores. If you have a low poverty district, that's five to $10,000. So you know what the county spend roughly per child? About $10,000, right in line with their higher income population. We spend about $13,500. Now I was a math teacher, so I know $13,500 is a whole lot less than $20,000 to $30,000. That's what our kids need each and every day. The stuff that they're dealing with is simply unimaginable. Since I became superintendent, I have had over two dozen students shot. Six of them have died. The next day, their sisters and brothers and nieces and nephews and friends and cousins have to come to school 
And we ask them to learn the Pythagorean theorem. Now we're going to continue doing that. We have to keep the bar high. We're not letting anybody off the hook. But we have to support them. Imagine your child, your grandchild, being the friend or sibling of one of these young people. Imagine the supports that they need to even be ready to learn the next day, let alone the day after that and the day after that. That's the reality for many of the children in Richmond Public Schools. And we don't want to just be average. I didn't come here, move my family, to create an average school system. I want to be a great school system. People all across Virginia, heck, all across the country come to see what did they do here? How did they do it? This place is extraordinary. That's what we're trying to build. And our vision is outlined in Dreams for RPS, our strategic plan, which uh, has been passed out. And I know we run out of copies, but we'll make sure we get more. Uh, just more data about us and the counties and everything. I described our poverty rate in RPS. It's about 50% higher than Henrico's. It's about twice Chester Fields, and it's three times Hanover's. So I don't want to hear any more about why RPS needs more money relative to the counties. The strategic plan we mentioned. When I got here, one of the things I heard is, OK, well, look, if we're going to give you more money, you got to tell us what you're going to spend it on. I think that's fair. So we spent several months in over 170 community meetings, including one right here at TJ, with the participation of over 3,000 people to create dreams for RPS. This is our plan, our vision for the future. It has five big priorities, and I didn't write this, and the board didn't write this, this came from the community. Priority one, exciting and rigorous teaching and learning. We want kids running to class with excitement, and we want what they are learning to be rigorous. We need to keep the bar high. One of the most foundational things we can do to set kids up for success academically is to make sure they are reading on grade level by the time they leave the third grade. Right now, a huge number of our kids are not. So we need to raise the bar. So in this budget are investments for reading specialists, new reading curricula to ensure that kids are reading on grade level by the third grade. And why is that important? Because in the third grade, you go from learning to read, to reading to learn. And we know if you are not reading on grade level by the third grade, you are four times more likely to drop out of school. Second priority, skilled and supported staff. We need to keep the great people we have, and we need more great people to come join the team. That's why in this budget is $6.1 million to give a raise to RPS staff. Our teachers in Virginia on average, are paid $10,000 below the national average. $10,000 below the national average. The General Assembly, we appreciate they just passed a raise, but here's the deal. They don't pay for the whole raise. They pay for a portion of it. As the mayor mentioned, because of this complex funding formula called the LCI, we are stuck with two-thirds of the cost of the raise. The state only puts up one-third. So this budget fully funds the local portion of that raise. It's not just teachers. That's nurses and bus drivers and custodians. I had a nurse that resigned because she was living on food stamps. We have to do better. Third priority, safe and loving school cultures. My number one job is to keep our kids safe. I say that as superintendent, but also as an RPS parent myself. But we want to do so much more than that. We want our kids to feel loved at school, to feel affirmed and nurtured for who they are, however they identify. We have to create those kinds of cultures in our school. So investments in this budget, more mental health and other supports to help our kids deal with the things going on in their lives. Also in this budget, new training for teachers on restorative justice, so we stop suspending kids, sending them home, they come back with the exact same problems, and the cycle continues. We have to break the school to prison pipe. And yes, there's even money in there to help our schools celebrate our students. Because right now, there are some schools in this city 
that have PTAs that can raise $70,000 a year, and other schools in this city that can raise zero. And that $70,000 goes for things like pizza parties and movies and things to celebrate kids who are doing great things. So as a matter of equity, we want to make sure that all schools and all sections of the city are able to do that. Last, I'm sorry, second to last, priority four, deep partnership with families and communities. We can't do this work alone and we're not even going to try. We need the help of our community. We need deeper partnership with our families. One of the things we're doing here, one of the investments, is a family academy to begin to train families in complex education topics like special education so that families can be stronger advocates for their children. And yes, voluntarily paying and training teachers to make home visits to deepen those relationships between teacher and family. And the fifth priority is modern systems and infrastructure We've talked a lot about the buildings, I'll say a little bit more in a second, but it's not just the building. Our HR system was created in 1988. 1988. We cannot create a 21st century learning environment for our children on 20th century technology. It just doesn't work. You can clap for that. Last facilities. I don't know what else to say on this. This, this is an actual bathroom. We fixed it. This was at Benford Middle School. Now, I got a lot of heat for posting that picture, but that's the reality. And so my question to you is very simple. If you would not send your own flesh and blood, child, grandchild, niece, nephew, to a school that had a bathroom like that, why should anybody in this So the mayor's budget puts $19 million, $19 million for roofs, new ACs, boilers. I got an email today. The heat's out, kids are cold. So we scramble to go fix it. But we have boilers 50 plus years old. Look, bottom line, either we're going to be a city for some of our residents or a city for all of our residents. And I am proud to work with Ms. Page and Ms. Dorr, with the mayor and his administration, because we are committed to ensuring that Richmond works for every single child and every single family no matter which zip code they are born into. Thank you. I have a... uh, real quick, I forgot, we have Principal Ricky from Benford Middle School to say a very quick word, and then we have Ram Bhagat, who leads uh, some of our school culture work, restorative justice and trauma-informed care, to also share a very quick word. <laughs> Thank you. So there's nothing like seeing that picture of the bathrooms at my school. And that's how our relationship started with Superintendent Camus. I'm extremely proud to work for him, to work with him. I've been at Benford for the last four years. Mayor Stoney, your leadership, we are on fire together. I'm up here for a brief moment because that picture for us was what we were living through in trying to convince current families that don't have choice, that it's okay, we'll just use another bathroom. All the while, as principal, newly appointed with a charge to increase enrollment, to offer rigorous academic programming, which we're doing successfully through the arts, to encourage families to stay. I did it myself. I moved my family from across the river in Chesterfield, where it was run differently. Work the students were served consistently because there was a calling for me personally. We live in the division, we live in the district that I serve. My son went to Benford and he was in those bathrooms and we were doing the best that we could. My daughter, when she was a first grader, spoke to city council and I asked her for advice 
last night. I said, Amelie, what do I do? I'm going to talk to a room full of strangers who might agree with the mayor's budget. I, heard, I certainly hope that they do. I said, what do I say? And she goes, Mom, be nice. <laughs> she said that. She said, be nice, because everybody wants to help. Because these are kids. Of course, everybody wants to help. And that was both <coughs> humbling, but also really frightening. Because I don't know that I agree with that. Our school serves the entire city. And that's where I'm not really sure. Because Benford, for the first time, was able to raise funds through the PTA to do the things that we just can't do with our budget. Our facilities crew is in our building tirelessly trying to make things just work. Amelie's coming to that school in two years. I'm trying to do her proud while also serving this entire city. She also said, Mom, know what you're standing for. And I could say that I'm standing for courageous, brilliant teachers. Teachers who are refusing to leave when things get harder. Teachers who are willing to spend their own money to keep our kids warm, to keep our kids connected. And she said, Mom, make sure you end with a strong statement. She's being educated in Richmond Public Schools, so this is her education speaking back to me. So I would just like to say in the short little time that I have with you, come to Binford and see it for yourself. If you are in doubt whatsoever about what Mayor Stoney is proposing, I invite you personally to come see it. Our school represents this entire city. We are doing what was asked of us in terms of providing safe, rigorous, challenging, affirming education to our kids. My teachers are staying because they feel valued. Come and see it for yourself and you help me problem solve. How many more beautiful murals and paintings can I use to cover the plaster holes that are coming down and crumbling after 104 years of being open with 45 years of deferred maintenance? Thank you for being here and fighting the good fight with us, Mayor Stoney. Thank you for your leadership. Superintendent Cameras, the pleasure's been mine. So good evening. Uh, my name is Ron Bagat, and I'm a retired Richmond Public School teacher. I taught in Richmond for 27 years. I taught in Henrico for three years, and I taught in DC Public Schools for one year. When I left Henrico Public Schools to return back to Richmond Public Schools, one of the things that stood out for me, because I was a chemistry teacher, one of the things that stood out for me was the difference in the lab. In Henrico County, I had a state-of-the-art lab. When I came to Richmond, I felt like it was, uns it was, it wasn't just that I felt like it. The labs were so unsafe in Richmond that I wouldn't even let my students work in the lab. And parents asked me questions like, how come your students aren't doing chemistry labs? And I took this, the, the parents on a tour of the labs that I, had, I was supposed to be working in. So I stuck with Richmond. I retired a few years ago. Did a sabbatical, started teaching again, retired again. And then when I was called back to work in this area of trauma healing and restorative justice in Richmond Public Schools, I felt like it was the perfect fit for me because of all of the things that I had learned as a teacher and plus my additional training. And I'd just like to say, some of the issues that we're dealing with in Richmond Public Schools around trauma also affect the county and other areas. But students cannot learn when they're in a hypervigilant state. It's physiologically impossible. Students cannot learn when they're excluded or, dis or suspended. They're not there. So our emphasis on trauma-informed practices and restorative practices is aligning with what's happening around the nation. And we're looking at how Richmond can be a model for dealing with urban trauma and dealing with exclusionary school discipline practices. So we need the support that is proposed by the mayor's budget. We need your support. We need to make Richmond a city that transcends our, the path, transcends our, the historical arms of our past and creates an environment that's an environment in schools that are safe and loving and nurturing 
so that all of our students have an equitable opportunity to succeed. Do better. This budget does better on behalf of the city's residents. 